And let's welcome our Tuesday trio of MPs, uh, always armed with common sense and political insight for their weekly showdown, uh, minus any acrimony. James Rajad is Conservative Chair of the Finance Committee. Megan Leslie is Deputy NDP Leader. And Liberal Cape Breton MP Roger Kuzner turned 59 today. Happy birthday, oh, oh, Roger. Oh, oh. You don't look anywhere near 59, by the way. My twin as well. James. All right. Um, quickly, there's three areas that sort of came out today. The Scotia Bank cut 1,500 jobs. The Bank of Canada governor said there's like 200,000 young people that want to work, but they're in their parents' basement because they're afraid of, you know, they're, they're chronic unemployment. They only can get jobs. And they, he suggested actually they work for free if uh, to get some experience on their resumes and finally food bank use is up again this year 840,000 people receiving assistance third of them children pretty grim statistic add it all up and i'd like you just to get your thoughts on whether this says something about the economy starting to slide again and what the government can and should do about it james you were the chair of the committee where uh, the bank of canada governor was at what do you think it says what, what should we read into all these disparate developments well, I, yeah, there's, and there's a whole bunch of issues there. I mean, overall, the global economy is not growing as fast as obviously we would like, and we're very much impacted on that. I mean, there are some positive signs. The U.S. is growing uh, better than expected in some areas, as well as the United Kingdom. So two of our larger trading partners are doing better. With respect to the issues you raise, I'm sure the governor uh, wished he had expressed himself better. I think what he was trying to say is people ought to, you know, sort of get as much experience as they can on their CVs, on their resumes, and go forward, because they do want to work. That's very much what he was saying. I mean, we've looked at that issue of internships, paid and unpaid, at the Finance Committee in two of our reports. And obviously, it's better if you have paid interns, as, as the three members here have had, so that they can get experience and get paid at the same time. But in terms of the overall economy, I mean, we're still seeing some very positive signs. And as the governor mentioned, I mean, we're still in an area of positive economic growth. The labor situation is very different, depending on what, what region you're in. And that's one question I asked him today in my area, you simply just can't find enough people to do all sorts of jobs. There's help wanted signs everywhere. But in other areas of the country, you have a very different labor dynamic. So I, I would encourage actually people to read our youth employment study at the Finance Committee. We had a lot of recommendations in there in terms of actually encouraging as many people in a young, at a young age to enter the workforce in various ways and then gain the experience they need. As I think the governor was trying to say, which is to gain enough experience so they get the type of job they want when they want it. What you take from all this trio of in some cases bad news. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say, how did you phrase it? The, you, you said uh, there's a problem with our economy right now. I wouldn't say that. I would say that there's a problem with our government right now and that we just, our, this government lacks the will to do anything about it. I mean, under the Conservatives, we lost 400,000 good paying manufacturing jobs. If you go to the, the food bank statistics that you're citing to me, well, one in four Canadians spends more than 30% of their income on housing. Why don't we have a national housing strategy? That is the perfect role for a federal government. It would help stimulate the economy. It would make sure people had secure housing. What about the fact that in Quebec, when they introduced childcare in Quebec, 70 thousand women re-entered into the workforce so that's that's a positive role for government that where we can create these kinds of programs that help people save money helps people get jobs helps stimulate the economy uh, helps put food on the table but I, we just don't see that action from this government bank layoffs issues with kids in the basement <laughs> it, it, parents want there, there are a number of uh, <laughs> i'm lucky i got my basement cleaned out there a couple of years ago there they're gone, they're gone yeah <laughs> uh but uh, no there, there are a couple of things i think that the uh the government can't ignore uh, i think the food bank uh this the statistic that sort of uh got it for me was the one in six households now uh in canada that are using the food bank are currently working, so they're you know they're they're coming from low-income families, low, you know low-wage jobs, or or just recently unemployed. Uh, you know the 66 percent increase in the number of Canadians that are working for minimum wage. That's concerning to me. And and the one I, I want you to I want to mention just the uh, unpaid internships. That sort of creates, um, you know, and I know James and those guys have done a lot of work on it, but it, it, it sort of widens that gap between the haves and the have-nots again, because, you know, if uh, my young fella is taking an unpaid internship, we can sort of help out with uh, paying the rent or putting some groceries in the, in the cupboards or whatever, mm -hmm. but if, if uh, you know, that, if that young person that wants to take that opportunity, that training opportunity, if he doesn't have those supports, mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, he, he's going to fall behind, or he's not going to be able to seize that opportunity. So again. It sort of widens that gap between the haves and the haves. But some experiences 
good to have on a CV. It's just if you get in these intern uh, hey, gigs that go on for years, uh, you know, that's a volunteer ridiculous. internship, an unpaid internship is, is is a prize, I guess, but it's a very distant second prize. Well, and, and obviously, I mean, all of us, I'm sure, volunteer in various ways, and that yeah. obviously looks good on your resume going forward. But yeah, you obviously want to have some kind of a remuneration for what you're doing in early age. I think just to address some of the things with respect to lower income, I mean, we, you know, increase support for a guaranteed income supplement for lower income seniors, working income tax benefit introduced by former Minister Flaherty for those lower income people who are working who sort of find a, a challenge getting over that uh, that bump at that level. If you look at our family tax plan, which is encouraging uh, greater payments to parents with children, parents of, uh, you know, of all family types of children uh, put forward there, it's a very different plan than the other parties. I recognize that, and that'll be a, a very interesting political debate going forward in terms of do you favor the conservative approach of providing the money to parents, let them decide, or do you favor a national daycare plan? So that'll be one of the major issues going forward in the next that's, election. That's a campaign issue. Um, mm -hmm. Speaking of issues, I think you, the NDP has raised, uh, and, and, and NDP MP has raised, about making Remembrance Day yeah. a stat holiday. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not going to come in time for next week, but uh, I, if there's ever been a mood to push something forward like this, this is probably it. It passed last yesterday, and it's gone off to committee. Is that right, Megan? Uh, yeah. Tell us about it. What, how would it work differently? This has been tried before. Uh, what do you mean, how would it work differently? Well, I mean, in Alberta, for example, it's a day off, uh, no matter what. Okay. But I understand that he is allowing that if it happens on a weekend, if remember, say, falls on a weekend, then it wouldn't be a day off in lieu or something like that. Right. I mean, the, the point with um, with Remembrance Day is it is a very specific day. Uh, right. And it, it does change on, like, Easter Monday is always Monday. Uh, so that is the day where we pay our respects. And I think when you mentioned there is um, an increased appetite right now, I agree. I mean, we have veterans uh, from the mission in Afghanistan, uh, and especially in light of uh, the two... Uh, terrible tragic deaths in the past weeks that's really captured the imagination of Canadians and I mean if you if you go to the National War Memorial and you see the outpouring the outpouring of, with notes and letters and flowers people want to recognize service so I think uh, it's a great bill and I think we're gonna get some good support it sounds like it is the government on side with this that you know I, I don't want to speak for the, my understanding is Aaron O'Toole supported it but my okay. I mean my personal view and you mentioned the Alberta situation is I think it it should be a national holiday and I think as a holiday in order to encourage people to attend Remembrance Day ceremonies and, and I would just second what Megan said in, in terms of what's happened with the tragedies this year but I'm finding an increasing number of people at all Remembrance yeah. Day events mm -hmm. both on the day itself and schools and the schools seniors are, home yeah. who are yeah. doing it the week the before. The schools have really done a tremendous to... job in the last number of years a kids really digging in of course they've got the multi visual you know the, the just multi-dimensional yeah. presentations now and it's been you know I try to get out to as many as I can. And they involve but, the veterans in the school mm -hmm. ceremony. Yeah, and very much so yeah and I know but, if but I the interject. Royal Canadian Legion are still concerned about uh, the piece of legislation, so I, I think we have to be respectful. Well, I think the concern concerns. is, and James is right, Alberta, it is a holiday, mm -hmm. uh, um, a province-wide holiday, and yet I've noticed that in, when the kids are in schools, it's a more focused thing on Remembrance Day because it's mm -hmm. brought into the schools. When they're off uh, out of school, they're in shopping malls and stuff, and sometimes they don't even stop for at 11 o'clock for a moment's silence. So. But I find, at least in my area, the schools increasingly are picking another day to do it so oh, that the, the children can attend, the cenotaph or can attend the ceremony that's held in their community. So not, I'm certainly finding that in my area. In, the, in a related place. development, the, the video, uh, there's video of inside the Hall of Honor and the, the Sergeant at Arms has made a policy decision that that's not gonna be released. Is that a good call, James? I think so. My understanding, Don, is that it's part of an investigation, so they want to obviously complete the investigation. As well, I, I, I would be hesitant to release the mm -hmm. video I, myself. I just, don't want to see the shooting, but maybe I, how just, he came into the main entrance or stuff. I don't know. Well, I think, frankly, if you follow a lot of the media reports, the media have a good idea of how he came in and, and yeah. how it ended. So I, I'm not sure, you know, when I, I was in the NDP caucus today or if our committee and I saw the bullet in the door, I'm not. I, I just speak for myself. I'm not sure how much more I need to see of that. So. Yeah, Megan? Yeah, it's it's hard for us, I think, because you we were, were all there. so close to uh -huh. it. Yeah. Um, I do, whatever happens, it, uh, the video release or not cannot jeopardize the investigation. So first and foremost, investigation. Once the investigation is completed, I don't know, I have, I have really mixed emotions about it. Um, I, 
absolutely understand the argument of we don't necessarily want everybody to know where those cameras are located and right, so right. the points of view and things like that also it's some pretty traumatic footage I imagine but at the same time I have an interest and I think most Canadians have an interest in some of the basics like how, how what exactly happened when he did come in will I don't think we need to hide the information, uh, but I think I do leave it in the capable judgment of the Speaker Roger. and Sergeant Arms. Yeah, I, I don't know if it adds a whole lot to uh, to, to move the uh, situation ahead or the issue ahead. So uh, you know, as long as the um, may, maybe present it to a, uh, a group, you know, the Board of Internal Economy, and get them to weigh in on it, like an all-party committee or something like that, but. Final topic. You're excused from this one. Uh, Dean Del Mastro, the former principal secretary uh, for the Prime Minister. Uh, there's a debate going on in the House. It might be finished by now. Whether he should lose his seat now or after he has uh, gone through the full judicial process, sentencing and any appeal and beyond. Uh, the reason Roger is, Roger's uh, Dean's roommate and close friend. So. <laughs> And that would James. be James. James, yeah. whatever your name is. James is a close friend of <laughs> Dean Del Mastro. So I, you said you didn't want to talk about it. I don't blame you. Megan, what should be done? Uh, well, on, we're here right now, so I, I'm not up to date on the debate, but I did get a phone call right before we went on air uh, to say that so the NDP put forward a motion saying we should, um, he should be suspended from the House immediately. My understanding is the Conservative House leader has supported that language uh, and says that uh, he'll be supporting the NDP motion. So I, I do believe that if he's been convicted, um, then he shouldn't be in the House. Plain James. and simple. You, Roger, well, I, I, I have man. A, <laughs> I have a boatload of respect for my buddy James. Yeah. And, uh, I know James or Dean? James, and I know that uh, James knows Dean as a good person, and uh, sometimes good people make mistakes or, you know, uh, screw up or, you know, pick one of the above. And the, the judge in this case has identified the fact that uh, the regulations were complied with. So that's what we're faced with. That's the reality that we're faced with. And... Uh, so it's, uh, it's just how those rules are applied now in the House, and I guess that's the debate that's going well, on. I mean, I think I have a right to address it. I mean, obviously, I have a complete bias. He's a very close friend of mine, but I, you know, I, I take the points in terms of a decision has been made by a judge, and, and so the action will be taken. But I, I think the points, there are a couple points made in the House, which is, first of all, I think we should accord him the opportunity to defend himself. So I would hope we would all sort of support that in this country. The second thing is, I mean, he's indicated he's going to do something, whether it's appeal or, or test a judgment or whatever legal avenues, and I don't want to get into that. But it seems to me he should have some right to precede that uh, by suspending him without pay, without allowing him any chance to defend himself. It seems to me is is somewhat premature. And if I mean, if he, it goes down and he loses the appeal, or if, or if the, it's ruled that he cannot even do an appeal, then, then but, we could make the judgment at that point. But it seems... You know, I, again, I, huge bias here. He's a very close friend of mine, and I, I obviously uh, support Dean personally. And the tragedy is, not the tragedy, but at the timing is, he just had his first child on Sunday. I know. A baby girl named Charlotte Grace, you know, it's just, you know, so I don't know. So. All right. I, uh, I gave Mike Duffy the chance to speak, and Pamela Wall, and Patrick Brazo, I guess he deserves it. All right, thank you both, or all of you. Appreciate that.